shock the worst of the recession off. So Keynes had a system that couldn't completely get rid of the boom and bust cycle, but I always think like a good antidepressant, it chopped the bottom off. But it also chopped the top off as well. So the excess inequality and high peaks that we see nowadays doesn't occur when you've got a Keynesian economic system. The neoliberals didn't believe this. The neoliberals, which they, became, they later became known, they believed in markets too, but they believed in unregulated markets. The chopping off of the growth and the buffering of the recession would actually be taken care of by the markets themselves. This was their core belief. Unfortunately, Hayek et al., they didn't get very far, mainly because Keynesian economics worked so well that there was no need to replace it. The second wave of neoliberals was led by Friedman, some of whom you may have heard of, and what later became known as the Chicago School of Economics. They took these ideas further. They made them logical, rational, coherent. But they did something that was really interesting. They started to create think tanks, and they started to position themselves in key positions in universities, and they started building I guess, students and followers around themselves. And yet, much to Friedman's frustration, their ideas still didn't become mainstream. But Friedman had a key insight, and it was this. The job of the radicals, and make no mistake about it, back then it was the neoliberals who were the radicals, the job of radicals is not to change the status quo, but rather to be, rather to be ready for when a crisis or perceived crisis occurs with a viable alternative. I tell people all the time in technology, if you want to change the way a large company works or even a medium-sized company works, you cannot come in and start bludgeoning the old system, trampling all over people's you know, values and histories. Rather, you need an alternative ready when a crisis or perceived crisis occurs. That is how change happens. The crisis did come. The crisis came in the 1970s with something we'd never seen before. A combination of inflation, so that's prices rising, and economic stagnation. Later, this would be labelled stagflation. Nobody knew what to do. And in our panic, we turned to neoliberalism and the deregulation of markets. This was prototyped. You should always prototype new ideas. It's a good idea. This was prototyped in New York City, where at the time there was high, uh, high crime, massive deficits, huge amounts of debt. It seemed to work in New York. Friedman then became mainstream, joining the government of Ronald Reagan. Um, Margaret Thatcher in the United Kingdom took neoliberalism forward, and Pinochet in Chile as well. The reason I point this out is because if you're my age, you live through this transition. Now, I'm really old. I'm, I'm 40. Uh, and at work, they call me the old man. Uh, and to be honest, working in tech, I feel quite old. Um, anyway, that's a different story. I'm not as old as Linda Rising. Um, transitions happen, and they happen slowly. They happen so slowly, you don't always see them. Now, you know an idea has gone from the fringes to mainstream when even the political left and the political right stick to it. Because Bill Clinton in the post-Bush and Reagan years and Tony Blair in the post-Thatcher years did not unravel the neoliberal framework. This is how we run our economies now. It is the system we live within. It was the Labour government in the United Kingdom who introduced tuition fees. Transitions happen. You've lived through one you might very well be living through another. So this brings me neatly to these contradictions from Marx, which I'd like to spend 10 minutes going into because I think it can be quite enlightening. And then after that, we'll take a quick look or a longer look at uh, the marginal cost contradiction. So the first one is... Uh, ge ge excuse me, I also need coffee and a sip of water. The first contradiction is to do with geography. Economic clusters occur usually around a resource, 
whether it's a natural resource or a man-made resource. We know that in parts of Italy, the silk trade uh, are clustered around certain key locations. We know that in Detroit, the automobile industry uh, rose and grew. Silicon Valley is a very famous economic cluster. And what tends to happen is a resource is discovered which brings in lots of entrepreneurs. The entrepreneurs start to make profit, and of course they need to be supported by auxiliary businesses, hotels, cafes, suppliers, etc. This attracts universities, where they teach the core skill that you need to exploit this resource, and slowly but surely, millions and later billions of dollars worth of capital is deployed in a specific geographic area. Now, of course, people compete, and so what happens when you're in a competitive environment is that an upward pressure is placed on wages. So the wage bill gets higher and higher and higher. The market reacts to this, specifically the housing market, and rents become higher and higher and higher. Then you get an extremely weird situation where millions or billions worth, billions of dollars worth of capital is deployed, and yet it's almost impossible to turn a profit. Container Solutions, the office in London, is the hardest office to make profitable and keep profitable because the wages we have to pay are absolutely extraordinarily high because of the rents people have to pay to live and work in London. It's the same in Silicon Valley. The contradiction is this. When capital cannot be deployed profitably, it just gets up and goes somewhere else. That's what it does. It's not sentimental and it's not nationalistic. Does anybody know where this is? I did this in America in front of a large crowd and they, they all groaned, Detroit. And I was like, yeah, okay, it's Detroit. However, I like to tell everybody a tiny piece of the story that they might not have heard before. The common theme, the common rhetoric and narrative deployed by politicians is that capital left America, left Detroit, and move itself to Asia, where it could be deployed more profitably. That's only part of the story. The capital from Detroit actually relocated itself to Tennessee, within the United States. That gave rise to, the, to a boom in manufacturing in Tennessee, but of course at the cost of Detroit. So you start to see the win-lose nature of capitalism, sometimes within national borders. Now, I know, well, I'm, I'm almost certain nobody knows where this is. Any takers? No? So this is uh, St Andrew's Quay in Hull, in East Yorkshire, England. Hull's my hometown. This is the Lord Line Trawler Company. We landed fish for 300 years in Hull. Uh, Hull Fair, it's in October. It's a large gathering. And I always thought, what a weird time to have a fair. But actually, the trawler men used to leave the city in January and stay at sea for eight or nine months. And then they would come back with all the fish, packed in ice, and then they would celebrate. They'd basically get drunk from October through December when they went back on the trawler. I came from a family of fishermen. They brought other things back as well, dead polar bears. Now, it seems cruel, but as a kid in the fishing museum, it was amazing to see these polar bears. We had a culture that built up around fishing. It's a tough town hall, tough people. Um, later on, we had auxiliary businesses. Uh, processing, pre-processing, packaging, logistics. The docks came to East Hull. We don't like people from East Hull in West Hull. So in, so in West Hull, we'd land fish, and in East Hull, they run the docks. Massive, booming city. Now, please don't laugh, because this is my heritage. Uh, you laughed, <laughs> right? <laughs> In the 1970s, England, or the United Kingdom, lost what are now known as the Cod Wars. This was a trade dispute between Iceland and part of the European Commission, handled by the Conservative government. Not that I blame them, it's just a historical fact. We lost the Cod Wars, we lost our fishing quotas. And do you know what Capital did in my hometown? It got up and left. And I was born into a de-industrialized city. We don't even knock these buildings down. It's like a momentum to a time that's 
gone, you know, gone past. The weeds are growing. The dock itself, this is a key where ships would come in. It's just got stagnant water in it. As the heart of the city died, the auxiliary uh, uh, channels died, the pubs, the hotels. This is the bull on Beverly Road. It was closed down, and then it burnt down, and then we put a token fence there to hide it, uh, as if nobody would notice. What comes along in deindustrialized de cities is alcoholism, drug abuse, domestic violence, terrible education standards. Hull has got the worst education in the United Kingdom. People in tech, much to my annoyance, speak, about, speak enthusiastically about creative destruction. They've never seen the destruction. Anybody who's lived in a deindustrialized part of the world never speaks about creative destruction like it's a good thing. The, the geographical nature of capital, the way it redeploys itself, gives us insights into the inequality it creates, geographical inequality. It also creates inequality by the way it's structured. So this device, this computer, these chairs, they all have value, right? We call it use value. How much is it worth to get use out of it? The houses we live in have got a use value. You know, it provides shelter, comf comfort, a place to interact with our children. A three-bedroom house in South London, where I live, will cost you north of two million pounds. Now, we know that a house has got some value, but it don't got two million somethings. So what's going on? Well, actually, in economics, there's another thing called exchange value. And that's the value you can get for something on a market, on an open market. Down the river, down the River Thames, there's a tower block, 183 apartments, only five of them are registered with the local council. This means, probably, only five of them are occupied. The rest of the, the tower block, the flats are empty. They're used as an investment device because you get a higher return on London property than you do on, for example, gold or oil or currency trading. Now, what this leads to is asset prices go up and a feeding frenzy begins. So you think, oh my God, I've got to get on, on the housing ladder, right? I've got to buy a house, or I've got to buy some gold. The prices go up and up and up, the market responds. At one point, you're thinking, well, I've made this much money, now I'm gonna get out. The first people who exit a speculative bubble, they make money, they make big money. The next few people who exit make good money. Everybody else loses. So when you have exchange value, inequality is baked into it. So a lot of people talk about capitalism creating inequality, but they can't exactly say why. Speculation with, exchange, with commodities on the exchange market is one of the core reasons. Okay, so that brings me to my, this brings me to my favorite. I think if you work in tech, this is, this is the best contradiction, the best Marxian contradiction. Economics can be complex, but fundamentally, it's th the equations are quite simple. You have fixed costs. The, 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 this building has a fixed cost. Um, you also have marginal costs. And a marginal cost is the cost it takes to produce one more thing, right? So imagine a factory with lots of cars in it. You, you, the costs of the factory are fixed, but if you produce one more automobile, you've got the cost of the materials, the cost of energy, and the cost of labor. For each new widget you produce, the marginal cost, of course, will go up. It goes up in proportion to production. This, this is where it gets very simple. Revenue minus marginal costs and fixed costs equals profit. The job of capitalism is to create profit. That's what we're supposed to do. So one way to increase profit is to drive down the cost of your marginal costs and one way to do that is to drive down your labor costs. This has always been done in two ways. Attack on unionized labor, uh, zero hour contracts. Zero hour contracts are an excellent device for mapping supply to demand exactly. That's the, that's the fantasy of all businesses. If the demand of our services is mapped to the supply of our labor force, our profits will be perfectly aligned with our cost structure. That's why zero hour, zero hour contracts are completely loved by business owners. I forgot where I was. Uh, 
Oh, yeah. So anyway, you drive down the labor costs against unionized labor. But what we do in tech is we contribute to driving labor costs down by automation. So automation has been an obsession of business owners from the very, very beginning. And the problem is, the, the problem is, is that capitalism is premised on a dynamic. You work in my factory, we sell something, and then I pay you, and I keep a little bit of profit for myself. This shaky relationship held for the whole of the post-war era, right? Labor, labor got paid well, the rising tide brought up all boats. Kodak, Eastman, New York, 65,000 people were employed by Kodak at one point. Now that whole industry is gone because it's been disrupted by WhatsApp and Facebook. I can get photographs to you now, you know, zero cost. Back then for Kodak, the situation was not bad. Kodak took some profit, but they redistributed massive amounts of revenue through the labor exchange, the exchange of labor for money. It's a great way to redistribute wealth. But as our labor force gets smaller and smaller and smaller, we, our ability to redistribute gets smaller and smaller and smaller. But most importantly for capitalism is nobody's left to buy your products. So if you think through this abundancy mindset, everything's free, nobody's working, how do you turn a profit? How would the capitalist system function? This was Marx's sort of key observation. If you succeed in 100% automation, then you're not going to have anybody left to buy your products. And it's this contradiction I want to go a little bit deeper into now. Try to answer this question, are we there yet? Let me just check the time. Uh, okay. I have a friend, I don't know why, but for some reason, I dismissed 3D printing as stupid for years. I thought, I wish people would stop talking to me about 3D printing. So I did what many people do when confronted with beliefs that don't fit into their own schemas. I just ignored it until I couldn't ignore it any longer. And then I just, just dismissed it as being ridiculous. I don't know why I did that. I think it's because people who like to do 3D printing are a bit annoying, right? Right? You know what I'm talking about, right? They keep printing their faces. I'm like, you're just like, fucking seriously? Are you, you are suggesting that this device that prints your own face is going to disrupt manufacturing? Okay. Well, I was wrong and they were right. My friend Anthony was in England last year and a small piece of his father's mudguard broke. And they went to the shop and they said, we need to fix this piece. And they said, no, no, no. You can only buy that mudguard as a fixed unit. Now, Anthony was annoyed. He's a physical product designer. He's not like us. He actually builds stuff. Uh, a physical product designer. So he sort of specced it out. He looked at it, sketched some things, stuck it in his 3D printer, pressed print. Him and his dad went to the pub. They were gone for a few hours, I think five hours, watching the rugby came back. And the device was 10% complete. So they went to bed. And in the morning, it was fixed. They attached it to the bike. Problem solved. So that poor manufacturer of mudguards just lost a unit sale. So you could start to glimpse how 3D printing maybe might disrupt current business models. Then Anthony did a wicked thing. He did a tremendously wicked socialist thing. He uploaded his file to a fanzine. Now apparently there's a whole subset of our community that likes 3D printing and biking, right? And maybe <laughs> drinking with their dad. So this tiny subset of people, he uploaded his widget, and if you go to their website, they've got all kinds of stuff. You can rebuild your whole bike with 3D printed widgets. Now typically what goes into a 3D printer is waste product, plastic, wood, all metals. So I thought, okay, that's interesting. I was still pretty dismissive. Until I saw that. And I was like, what the fuck is that? Right? It's a 3D printer. And I'm like, fucking massive. See, in my mind, 3D printers are small, very small. And I started to have this recurring dream where I bought a 3D printer. And when I went to work, I came back and there was two. <laughs> then when I went back the next day to work, I came back and there was two small ones. And I'm like, guys, you've got to stop printing yourselves. It prints fucking houses. Okay, right. Mind, mind completely blown, right? Mind completely blown. These guys print houses too. 
unique designs. They're very, very uh, protective of their ideas. OK, 3D printing, on the one hand, doesn't seem revolutionary to, to me. Then I started to think about how would this work economically. There's a phenomena known as reshoring. This is on the agendas of many, many manufacturers, unless they've already begun to do it. Labour, even labour in countries where the economic situation is worse than ours, where the wage bill is very low, is still expensive. Labour is still expensive even when it's very cheap compared to a machine. And machines don't cry about human rights either, right? You can never switch them off. Um, that you know, they're indefatigable. They keep moving forward. So if manufacturers can, they will bring manufacturing back to Western Europe and parts of the United States. It's a process known as reshoring. The general population don't know too much about it, but it's pretty real. Part of the strategy for reshoring is to use 3D printing in medium-sized localized clusters. So imagine, if you will, my hometown of Hull, deindustrialized, we start to build medium-sized factories where our larger factories and fisheries used to be. So now we start to solve the problem of logistics, but of course we have almost full automation. Associated with reshoring is something called jobless recoveries. If you look, don't take my word for it, go on, go on Google, actually, don't take Google's word for it either, uh, do a bit of research. We have recessions. We've had a few recessions in the last 20 years. GDP goes down. Unemployment grows. GDP comes back. Unemployment stays the same. Jobless recoveries. ING Bank in the Netherlands regularly and periodically cutting jobs. 1,600, 1,200, 2,000 jobless recoveries. They are learning to do more with less. APIs, open, so open APIs from banks and governments letting third parties to build, applica build applications. We are doing more with less. The civil service is shrinking. I consulted to Leeds City Council seven, eight years ago. I saw this firsthand. And of course, there was huge resistance because people know getting people to vote for automation is like getting a turkey to vote for Christmas. It won't happen. I gave this talk in Germany only six months ago, and when I said this was real, there was a collective groan from the audience. And yet, Adidas have started to bring manufacturing back to Germany for the first time, I think, in 30 years, because it's now cheaper to use 3D printing than it is to get your shoes manufactured in parts of Asia. Even better than this, there's, there's another type of 3D printer that finishes your shoe, so you can buy your shoe, the sort of frame if you like, and they will finish it in the shop, and some shopping district around here, it'll be ready for you in a day, with your own colours and your own different styling. So again, this prosumer model where the consumer is actually helping to produce the final product is becoming more and more real. So 3D printing is real. This Adidas shoe has been 100% 3D printed. This truck from Mercedes, is going to come online in 2025. Apart from the panelling, which requires huge machinery, every single piece of this truck can be replaced by parts that are printed with 3D printers. Ceramics, metals, and what they do is they superheat metals, print the part, it will be ready and waiting for you, waiting for you the next day in a local supplier. If you think about this for one second, it's absolutely staggering. If there's anybody from the Agile community here or any of you poor people who got caught up in the, the sort of lean software craze from 10 or 15 years ago, you will remember all of these. It's the seven key wastes of lean. Most of them vanish when you print parts local to where you need to use them. Supply gets mapped one-on-one -on -one to demand. On top of killing the seven wastes of lean, it also solves the last mile problem. 28% of the total cost of a good that you purchased 
is wasted on getting it from the distribution centre on the outskirts of Berlin into your house. 28%. 3D printing starts to solve the last mile problem. So, we know we can reduce marginal costs by 3D printing widgets with waste products, or in some cases, hot metal. What about energy, the other component of um, uh, marginal costs? For this story, we've got to go back to Yorkshire. We invented the windmill in Yorkshire. I'd just like to get that out there. Yeah? Any Dutch people in the room? Any Dutch? No Dutch? Well, you're Dutch. Yeah, fuck you. <laughs> right? We invented this. Now, gra granted, you commercialised it and deployed it across your whole country. The windmill went viral. Within only 300 years, it was everywhere. The windmill did something that was uh, astonishing. The only form of power in the 13th century came from water, right? Water wheels. And one of the primary uses of water wheels was thumping, which was used to pre-process wool. So imagine a lot of wool from a sheep. These, these arms would be connected to a water wheel and they would alternate. And then the wool would get hit, bashed, made malleable so that people could spin it. This was extremely labour intensive, but water was attached to land, and land was attached to a landowner. So power was not democratised, not at all. So if you wanted to get access to this power, you had to pay your dues, pay your fees, and of course, the landlord, why would he share? What windmills did was actually take the ability to pre-process products and stick them on the, the end of your house. Now, a little bit related to 3D printing, what you actually got was localised craft products and the power to build them. This led to a gigantic, and I mean gigantic, economic boost. Essentially, this was the beginning of the end of the Dark Ages. So to say that the windmill was a sort of, uh, what's the word? What's the word? Killer technology, disruptive technology, is absolutely spot on because it utterly destroyed the political and economic system of the time, which was feudalism, or at least contributed to the destruction of it. Oops. Now, fast forward a few more years, and you find that there are people on the political left and the political right that love solar energy, but for different reasons. Those on the political right want to smash the monopolies of the big energy companies. They want to empower people to run their own power and almost become business people by selling power back to the grid. Now, those on the political left, they like solar, you know, because it's just sort of trendy and a hippie, nice thing to do, right? It attacks climate change. Those on the right, they don't care about climate change. They care about money. But so what, right? If it leads to the deployment of a great technology, Fantastic. So in my mind's eye, I start to see solar panels, localised manufacturing. There's a problem with solar energy. I get this feedback all the time. Um, they say, well, well, the problem with solar is that the sun only shines 10, 12 hours a day. And in Germany, it only shines for like three hours a day. So, you know, the power source is not stable, people say to me. It's very smug, usually. And I say... Well, what about that? It's like, fuck you, take a look at that, right? What this is, is uh, part of a solar installation in Chile. It's part of an array of solar installations. They've also got them in Morocco. These have been uh, uh, popped as we speak right now. The mirrors are actually not solar panels, but what they do is they angle the sun's rays to a central column here, which distributes power under the ground distributes heat. Underneath the ground, there's molten, uh, well, actually, the salt, minerals, rocks. They're superheated. They're used to drive the turbines. But when the sun sets, the rocks are still hot. So the heat dissipates overnight, thus continuing to drive the turbines. This is actually an old idea. Anybody from the Austrian or Swiss Alps in the room? Yes, you're, you're cool. The Dutch. <laughs> Dutch are not cool. So my wife's Dutch, you see, yeah, there's simmering resentment somewhere in here. Um, oh, video. I was just kidding. I was kidding. Okay, so the, Swiss, the Swiss know how this works. Uh, 
demand for energy is low during the day because everybody's out, you know, yodeling and lifting weights, uh, farming, things like that. Uh, so what they do is they use the excess energy capacity to pump water up the mountain and they leave it there until the evening and then they switch it on and the water trickles down, driving the turbines. So fundamentally, the idea behind this is not new, but we're now finding new ways to deploy this using solar panel. Solar panels and solar technologies, okay. Okay, my favorite, open source software. This is the Elasticsearch framework for Mesos. This is what kicks this whole process off. This is free, free to download, free to change, free to use, no warranties, right? Uh, so, you know, use it at your own peril. But what this does is replicates the Elasticsearch database over distributed nodes. If the nodes get killed, they get brought back to life. So we've combined the functionality of Elastic with the functionality of Apache Mesos, right? There's not an engineering team in the world could have built this 10 years ago, maybe even five years ago. So you see knowledge is cumulatively growing. With these open source tools, we can do so much more now than we could five years ago. Where will we be in another five years? So I think if you look at solar, 3D printing, and open source software, each of them has the power to disrupt. What happens when you start to combine them? Coming back to Kodak, poor Kodak, utterly disrupted by Facebook, WhatsApp, digital cameras. They invented the digital camera, right, just like we invented the windmill. Uh, and they funded a whole company. All of that value that used to be redistributed to their shareholders and to the people who worked at Kodak and to the people who bought their products is now collected by a handful of people who work at WhatsApp and Facebook. The reason trickle-down economics works and the rising tide raises all boats is because through the labor exchange, value was spread. With software, you can create a business where 10, 20, 100 people benefit from products that go global. And typically in software, it's winner takes all. What's the competitor to WhatsApp? Anybody know? I, sorry? I've never heard of it. Right? What's the competitor to Facebook? So in software, it's winner takes all. So massive, massive societal value is redistributed to a handful of people. Maybe that's fair because they're, you know, entrepreneurial. But where does it leave the rest of us? So our economy has been disrupted in ways we've never really experienced before. Can there be a fight back? This is Utrecht in the Netherlands. Oh yeah, my question, are we there yet? You can start to answer that question by seeing how people are reacting to what's happening. The Dutch government, very forward thinking, right, you're my friend again. The Dutch government, very forward thinking, then run an experiment with universal basic income in Utrecht. UBI, as it's known, is a way to redistribute wealth without having to work. Everybody gets the same amount of money. So I guess in this experiment, the Dutch is saying, well, why should your economic value be connected to the amount of labor you do? That's a pretty industrial notion. They want to make a fair society. So a lot of the eyes of the world are currently on Utrecht to see what are the results of this experiment. Universal basic income is tactical. One of the reasons we still use people in banks, in manufacturing, is because they're still cheaper than machines in some cases. If you give everybody money, obviously the cost of their labor goes up. So it will increase the speed of the adoption of automation. This is St. Ives in, this is St. Ives in Cornwall. They have done a referendum where they've said, if you don't, do not own a house, you cannot live in the house. So they're basically outlawing the exchange of property for speculation. It's a form of regulation, isn't it? So it's a sort of return to the pre-neoliberal days. A lot of eyes are on St. Ives. What's going to happen there? So... Can it happen? Are we there yet? So the question is, are we there? That I, for me, that's an open question. There's interesting evidence from different parts of the world. The numbers certainly don't lie. The jobless recoveries are real. Reshoring is real. 
Factories, in England we call them one man and a dog factory because they have one man who's a security guard and got a dog and he has to feed the dog. They don't actually take part in the manufacturing process. Can it happen? Even the Victorians at some point thought it was morally repugnant to put children in factories and up chimneys, right? And of course, the same backlash that you can expect now around universal basic income happened then. If you don't let us use children in the labour process, we won't be able to build the church spire, people said. And God knows we need more church spires in the United Kingdom. The same resistance, you'll kill profitability, you'll kill innovation. And yet, in the United Kingdom, we brought in what, now is, what are now known as the Factory Acts. These protected children, they protected women, and of course, what happened to profitability? It went up, because they replaced the children with machines. Could we see something like this now? Could we see legislation that protects or changes working hours? Could it happen? Open questions that we need to answer. So, my conclusion is this. Um, I lived in a time of a great transition. Um, a great politically difficult period in the time of uh, the United Kingdom. This is a picket line from in Yorkshire during the miners' strike. So sure, unionised labour wasn't working. If my mum wanted to buy a new telephone from British Telecom or ask for a new telephone for the upstairs bedroom, it would take six weeks to arrive. We didn't own the telephone, but we rented it, right? This could not work. You can't run a modern country on that. And yet, yet, why was Labour so violently attacked in the United Kingdom when France and Germany were going through different transitions? So the choices we make, the policies we choose, will have an effect. The reason I love this photograph is because you see the whole of the United Kingdom was divided. There's a lot of talk recently about the divisions in the United States and the divisions across Europe. And we're split right down the middle, as if this is a new thing, right? I mean, I suggest people in tech read more history books. So you've got the miners on the left, the police on the right, the instruments of the government versus the people. Hillsborough football disaster. Difficult moment for anybody who's my age. A news flash takes us over to a different football game where 96 people had been killed because of an error, human error. People had been redirected into one gate instead of three. What came next was, probably, was, 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 was worse, salt in the wounds. Uh, police cover-up from the South Yorkshire Police. 25 years the truth kept buried. You cannot run a cover-up campaign like this unless it's supported by the highest levels in your own government. Margaret Thatcher called the workforce the enemy within. So those of you who think in, in Europe that England's always been a cool place to live, I can assure you that it's not. And a silent civil war simmered all the way through the late 70s and 1980s. The police were an instrument of government. That was the reaction to the transition, the economic transition. 25 years, the truth comes out, the real truth. We finally put this dark chapter to bed. And I always say, nobody on the left or the political right wants to return to these days. So thus my conclusion is this. The decisions we make, the things we tweet, the things we read, small, tiny things, each of which accumulate to something much, much bigger. They accumulate to the society we want to choose. This is not a choice for politicians tomorrow, it's a choice for us today. Choose wisely. Thank you. So great talk. So we as Dutch, we took your technology, we deployed capital in Holland to build these windmills. And this capital came from your... You, you did it very well. You, you, you took that innovation and took it further. So the questions, we got the question on, on the speaker brain. The question is from, for the introverts. The question was, in this perfect world of automation and abundancy, how will the world be like? An awesome world where the people can focus on developing their personal skills and enjoy their work. 
a free time and left without any motivation and just sit on their couch. So the question is, what will happen in this perfect world of full automation? I've got a metaphor that might work for a tech audience. It's Star Wars versus Star Trek, right? Will we have this Star Trekian utopia where people support each other? And that 3D printer, that thing where, you remember when Jean-Luc Picard says, T, Earl Grey, and the T appears? Earl Grey horse, thank you. Will we live in a Star Trek world, or will we live in a world where uh, we're motivated and lazy? That question's easy to answer. Uh, I know many rich people, because they work in tech, right? They've made it, or they've half made it. Uh, they can take time off, they never have to work, but they do work. I know many people who have to work, but they've got side projects. Most people I know are not lazy, they're tremendously intrinsically motivated, and with the tools available, that have been made available via the web, I've, there's nothing in my observations or in my readings to suggest we will become a lazy sort of person. The human being is infinitely active. Take a month off work, remember, you're educated. You're educated from a very young age to work nine to five, like you're in an old factory. Take a month off work, the first two weeks you'll be anxious. Oh, I'm so lazy, I've been watching Game of Thrones for two weeks. But in the third and fourth week, your mind will start to open. You will find opportunities to use your time well. That's good. More questions? Thanks, everybody. Enjoy the conference. <laughs> <laughs>